Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 2, Halacha 7. Imagine a chessboard. That is what we're going to try to plant today. We're trying to figure out how do we put different crops in close proximity. Now, the chessboard is something to keep in your mind throughout this year. Instead of having 64 checkers, though, we are going to have 24 checkers. That is going to be what this chessboard is going to be like. It is going to be a 24-piece uh, board, so to speak. Now, why do we get to 24? Well, the Betza'ah is composed of 24, uh, 24 parts. The Betrova is 1 24th of the Betza'ah. Now, the question is going to be, in this checkerboard, how can you make and maximize as many of the different uh, bet rovaim in a close proximity with different species? And one of the ideas over here is we've got to look back at uh, Vaikra 1919. Over there, it's saying that you're not supposed to mix the field when you're sowing it. So... How do we do it with the rules that we've learned so far in Kalayim, where we take this 24 by 24 uh, piece chessboard, and we can maximize, we can arrange different plantings on here where we're getting as many of these 24 spots planted as possible while maintaining the laws of Kalayim. Now, there's going to be a malokit here between Rabbi Meir and the, the sages, the Tanakama, and Ultimately, the sages are going to be articulating the view that's the Durabanan view of how many of these spots can you fit of this 24 that you can plant without it being Kalayim. And Rabbi Meir is going to be taking a, a very lenient view that is going to be based on the Rosh Tor and is going to be uh, really, the the Duraita explanation of the maximization of this, but we don't go by Rabbi Meir on this. We're going to go by the sages. The sages are saying a different number. Now, Rabbi Meir is going to be saying that uh, you can do all of the plots, and he's going to explain how you can do all the plots. The Tanakama is going to be saying, no, it's just going to be nine. You can do nine of the plots, and we're going to get into an explanation how you're fitting 9 out of the 24, and let's get into this Mishnah. So the Mishnah says, if someone wishes to make his field into many plots of all different species, he makes 24 plots uh, to a bet se se of land, each measure, each plot measuring a bet rova. Again, the bet rova is 1 uh, 24th of the part. The bet se, uh, by the way, is 50 amos by 50 amos, and that is going to correspond to the temple courtyard. So if you have two bet, bet se'ah, that is going to be the size of the temple courtyard. That's 50 amos by 100 amos. And the, you know, half of that is going to be the legal status for what qualifies it as a field. Very agotic that it corresponds to the, uh, the Mishkan uh, courtyard. And uh, we're dealing with in terms of plants like trees and, and maximizing your nutrition for the trees and you're maximizing your grain and it's all corresponding to the, the Mishkan courtyard. Very, very deep. So it's one half of the Mishkan courtyard. Now, the Bet Rova is going to be 124th and we learned that if it's just under a Bet Rova, Bet Rova, by the way, is going to be 4.16% of this. So if it's just under... This 4.16%, the grain that's next to it is going to nullify what's going to be there in some cases. So that's that's going to be an opinion. And the idea is that, but if you have the bet rova, you don't get these nullification rules. And it's going to be regarded as significant. So that's why we're, we're dealing with the bet rova uh, in particular, because... Again, if you are if you're planting smaller pieces, it's not going to be significant enough, and then it's going to be regarded as kalayim because of nullification rules. And then if you're trying to maximize it, uh, it might not combine. That's a malokit 
with uh, Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon holds that it will combine. The sages are saying that uh, when you're putting many, many of these species together, it's not going to necessarily combine. And so if you put many, many, many different species onto this bet rova and, and uh, I'm sorry, the bet seya, and you're doing smaller pieces than the bet rova, then you're going to get into nullification issues. And effectively, you're going to be going into the rules of Kalayim because they're not all going to add up together with one another. Now, at the Bet Rova, it's going to be substantial enough where it's not going to nullify. And you're, you're going to get uh, into where it's going to be a standalone mini field. It's going to be regarded as a small field. Now, this again is Rabbi Mayer's position. And it says that and he plants whatever species is desiring. In each of these uh, bet rova, in other words, the maximum number of species you can plant in the bet sa'a is going to be 24. Now, when we're when we're looking at this, uh, according to Rabbi Meir, these squat these square plots measuring a bet rova that are going to be planted with different species, they don't need separation between them. Why is that? Because in the view of somebody who's filling up this bet sa'ah with as many bet rovas as it can hold, each square bet rova is going to be planted with another species, and it doesn't need, according to Rabbi Meir, and this is not the halacha, it does not need a separation between these different plots. And Rabbi Meir, according to the Rosh, is explaining that these plots are, because they are square shape, are viewed as separate and distinct from one another. And you can clearly see that these are separate plantings. And because you can see that these square plots are separate from one another, even though they're all next to each other, that it's going to be distinctive enough. That is not the halaha. However, we are going to see what is going to be the halaha uh, from the sages, and that's going to rely on the Rosh Tor concept, which is going to get into um, uh, squares touching at the corners or triangles. Now, the Mishnah continues and says, if there are one or two unplanted plots, one may plant them with mustard. And if there are three unplanted plots, one may not plant them with mustard. For it would appear as a field of mustard. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir is basically saying that uh, regarding this 24-plot piece of land, and a field of mustard, that he's basically going to be saying that the mustard, as explained by Rabbi Kanievsky of what Rabbi Meir is saying, that the mustard is permitted in two of the adjacent plots because it's typically planted in these small plots anyway. So it's going to be distinct and easy to see from everything else and from somebody walking by as separate. And therefore, even if you have two adjacent bet rovas, then you can see it as being uh, small enough like mustard field because people are used to seeing these small plots being planted for mustard, and so it doesn't look abnormal. But when they're getting into three bet rovas, that's going to be prohibited. And the idea about the three is going to be because this is going to now be dealing with something that's going to be more significant. And the idea is that in terms of two, you have a leniency, but in terms of three, now it's just going to look like you went ahead and you planted a mustard field. And now it's just going to look like everything that you're doing is mustard, and it's going to look like kalayim. That's going to be the issue. Now, the sages are going to dispute Rabbi Meir's for, first ruling regarding the... Um, the uh, plots, the 24 plots in this, this chessboard or this checkerboard. Now, the dissenting view by the sages are going to say that nine plots are permitted, but 10 are forbidden. So you have your little chessboard here, and it's going to be uh, 24 uh, squares. And out of these 24 squares, the sages are going to say nine. Nine are going to be permitted, 10 are not. Now, I want to explain the position of the sages. The idea, according to the sages, is that there's no special rule for plots measuring precisely the bet rova. And in the case of Rabbi Meir, he would be saying that if you had 
less than a bet rova, he would agree that now you're going to get into problems with this chessboard. We're talking about everything being precise. And in terms of uh, smaller pieces, you're going to get into nullifications. And even Rabbi Mayer would agree that you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to be able to do 90, uh, 24 pieces on this chessboard if you have smaller than a bet rova because of nullification issues. But over here, the sages are saying that, no, 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 no. It's going to be nine because you have to use Roche Tours in order to pull this off. And the only way to configure this is going to be a 3 2 one, two, one pattern where none of the side squares are going to be surrounded. Now, that's not exactly true. You can actually, in theory, fit on a 24-piece chessboard. You can fit 13 squares, not 9. So why is it that we're at 9? Because the sages are saying that, and this is a Darabinan issue, the sages are saying that the 9 of the bet rovas are really the only way to have it where it's going to maximize what you're doing. You're going to be using the, the laws of Kalayim to help you with Rosh Tours. In other words, all of the squares are going to be touching at the corners. You don't have anything adjacent to it. And you have, you know, gaps in between, you know, empty gaps in between, you know, the squares so that, you know, these are, these are empty plots. They're not filled with any kind of crop. And between this crop and that crop, it's only touching at the tip of the, of the square, which we're allowed to do under the Roche Tour rules. And, and uh, it's going to be seen as a visually distinctive planting, but the reason that you're at 9 and you're not at 13 is because if you're doing 13, you're doing more than 9, you're doing 10, they're forbidding 10 or more, that it now looks like a, a mixed field. And so somebody who's walking by is now going to see something that's going to have a Morris Ein issue of many, many small plots with many different varieties growing within the small plots. And the sages are saying, visually speaking, mathematically speaking, nine is going to be the limit, the visual limit for somebody walking by to see something that's not going to be Kalayim, that's going to be significant enough. Each field is going to be significant enough of these little bet rovas, but they're not touching each other except at the Roche Tour corner. And they're, they're, um, you walk by and you don't see a, a jumbled mess. And if they're doing more than 10, the sages are saying that it's going to look like Kalim and it's going to be banned to Rabbanon. So there's a final view, and this is going to be the, the strict view. And Rabbi Eliezer Ben Yaakov says that even if one field in the entirety is a bet core, a bet core, by the way, is going to be 30 bet sa'a, so it's a very, very big field, one should make uh, one should make that there's only a single plot of a different species. So really what he's saying, he's saying that there's no special distinction for square bet rova plots which would require the usual separations between fields. But he's taking the strict view more than the sages, and he's saying that a single field, even as large as a bet core, which is going to be 30 bet sa'a fields, it's 30 times bigger than what we're dealing with, that it can't take more than two species of in plots of a bet rova or more. And the idea is that the two species, says the Hazanish, require the normal degree of separation mandated between fields. So he's saying that even if you have a very, very big field, and even if you have a very, very small field that's going to be the bet rova, and you're, you're, you're so big, you're 30 times bigger than what we're talking about, and you have this tiny field, right? He's saying that you have to maintain the normal separations. You can't, you can't take within the same field and plant two uh, things within it. And that's, that's the most strict view. Now, the sages are saying, no, within the, within the same field, you can maximize something, but you have to do nine distinctive plots. So that is very di different from Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says, you can take a very large field, and within that very, very large field, 30 times larger than the field the sages are talking about, you can only plant one species. And if you want to plant a second one, and you want to go with a bet rova thing, 
you need a normal separation like what we've been talking about to separate between this field and that field. So very, very uh, strict. The Gemara, and that, that's, by the way, not going to be the halacha. So the, the Mishnah says that the sages say, and this is identifying the subject of this dispute between Rabbi Meir and the sages, and Hiskia says in the name of Rabbi Yasa, who says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, that the sages' response was stated regarding the beginning of Rabbi Meir's ruling, which is concerning the maximum number of species permitted in a bet sa'ah. So, the, you know, one might think that the sages were responding to the second part of Rabbi Meir's ruling, talking about the mustard. But the sages are actually saying, no, that we're actually referring to the first part of your dispute, not about mustard, but in general, how do you maximize the bet sa'ah for how many different things you could theoretically plant? So, the Gemara is going to elaborate the position of Rabbi Meir and then explain what the sages are saying. And Rabbi Meir says in this Gemara that a bet rova of plots are permitted even if they are closed in by other species and even if they adjoin the other species. So he's basically ruling that you can plant as many as 24 different species in the bet sa'ah. Now that means that in square number one, that's right next to square number two, that you can, you can plant a different species there as long as they're both going to be a bet rova in square number one and square number two. The sages are saying, no, you have to have a gap there in square number two. And if you want to plant between square number one and square number two and square number three on this row, well, square number two has to be left off as a gap. You can't plant anything there. You can't surround your field with anything. There can't be anything adjacent to it. That's going to be the point of the sages. And they're saying that it can't be closed in by uh, anything because uh, you have to have this uh, enough separation where somebody walking by is not going to get a Mars sign problem and it's going to be visually distinctive. So the Gemara says that the sages say that they are permitted only if the plots are neither closed in by the other species nor adjoin the other species. So in our 9 2 one, two, one square pattern on this 24-piece chessboard, okay, that basically the squares that they're having, okay, on the ends like, you know, on the very bottom, let's say you have this one that's like left over in the middle, there's nothing, there's nothing surrounding it. Okay, and when they have the two that's going to be above the one, there's nothing surrounding those two. They could theoretically fit in more, but they don't. Okay, and even with the three at the very top of this field, you know, they have, they have a, a bet rova, then they have a gap, then they have a bet rova of something else, then they have a gap, and then they have something else. Well, there's nothing on the other side of the field. Uh, that you could put adjacent, right? Because that's not your field. We're talking about what is your field. So they're saying that within this 3 2 one, two, one pattern on this 24-piece chessboard, that you can't surround the plots with anything else. And each one of these plots have to be touching at the bet at the at the Roche tour on the corners. And the only way you can fit that and still maximize everything, that's going to be nine squares. And they're saying that, um, yeah, in theory, could you get 13, you know, when you go through the math of this? Yes, but they're not allowing it because they're saying that it, it's going to look like, it's going to look like you've intermingled and you've inter, uh, you know, you've sown the field with many different species. And the only way to create enough visual distinctiveness is to have it where these little plots are not surrounded by anything and there's gaps between the plots. It's not fully utilized. Now, the sages are going to permit only nine bet rova plots to the bet seya, and the Gemara is going to explain how the nine plots are configured. And it says that this is how it's done. You know, in other words, how are the nine bet rova plots arranged within the bet seya? And it's saying in the following pattern, it says three Two, one, two, and one. In other words, um, according to this uh, pattern, uh, the reference is by, you know, you have a five by five grid and uh, only 
24 out of the 25 are actually going to be you know, part of this Betsa'ah. And the fifth, 25th square is only going to be there to simplify the math. But the idea is that if the first row on the top is going to be where you're going to have where it's the, the leftmost uh, square and then you have a gap square, then you have a square that is in the middle that is planted, and then you have a gap square that's unplanted, and then you have your rightmost square is going to be planted. Nothing surrounds that. Then in your next row, it can only touch the corners. That means you can only fit two. You can only fit two. So if you're going to have two, they're going to be touching, you know, from the squares up top. And that means on the second row, you have three unplanted squares. And then in the middle, wherever you put the planted square, it has to touch the corner of the others so that you can put that um, you know on the leftmost side or in the middle and then again you know your squares have to touch at the corners so on the next row uh, they can be touching uh, you know the squares from the top the one square in the top and that's how you can fit two and then you can only do one again and that's going to leave it where um, it's significant enough but when somebody is walking by, it's not going to look like an intermingled field. Now, the Rosh and the Rambam are going to uh, ignore the 3 2 1 2 pattern, and uh, the Pene Arie and the Hazanish is suggesting that perhaps the Rambam uh, uh, had uh, different versions of this Gemara, and uh, the Hazanish is going to be saying that. And by the way, there sometimes are gaps in Gemaras for the Yershalmi. So um, sometimes, for instance, like in the end of Makot, the Geneza manuscript has the missing sugya. But if you look in any of the uh, uh, manuscripts that they have, uh, like in you know Leiden or in the London manuscript for the Yershalmi, it's missing. It's just not there. So perhaps, as the Chazanish and the Pnei is, is suggesting that perhaps... Uh, he did not have this 32121 Gemara there. But the Chazanish is saying about this that uh, he's suggesting, you know, a reading that would bring, you know, the Rambam into, into uh, consonance with this Gemara. And, you know, he's, he's trying to explain this as three referring to the number of planted squares in the first row and two referring to the empty squares that divide the planted ones. And then the one is going to refer to the following row, the second row. That's going to be left uh, totally unplanted. And uh, then, you know, we, you would have this third row containing three planted, two unplanted. And then the following one would leave, you know, one row unplanted. And, you know, that's another way that they can do it and fit it in to explain uh, with the Rambam. Now, the, the idea is going to be that Yes, in theory, you could fit in 13, but again, uh, you know, visually speaking, the rabbis are setting a limit to 9. And the Hazanish in his Kalayim 611 book is going to be explaining that the difficulty uh, by positioning, you know, two aspects of the sage's ruling, because again, you could fit 13 with their criteria, but now they're saying only 9. The sages are holding that there's no special permit for the bet row of a squares, rather, the sewing must comply, says the Hazanish, with the usual laws of Kalayim separations. And even if the squares, says the Hazanish, are not adjoining and do not surrounding one another, as the sages are saying, the sages do not allow more than nine squares of different species per bet sa'ah. Now, more than this number is going to be prohibited, as the Mishnah is saying, and the Hazanish explains about this, because again, in theory, if you're going to say, well, you can't do adjoining uh, and you can't surround one another, well, you can theoretically do uh, 13 squares. You don't, you, know, you, you don't need to just limit it to 9. But the Hazanish explains that you know, more than this number is prohibited because such a diversity of species in a single area gives the appearance of the mixture, and that's why it's going to be forbidden as Kalayim. So that, yes, you know, as the Hazanish says, although you know, the Betza'ah can accommodate more than 9 squares that are neither adjoining nor surrounding, only nine are permitted because of the, the imperative to uh, 
appear to give to avoid the appearance of, of commingling. And basically the sages are saying that any other configuration other than nine uh, makes it look like you've uh, either enclosed the squares, which is not acceptable, or you've uh, joined the squares, which is not acceptable, or what you've done is you've overplanted it, and so it, it gives the appearance of a mingled field. So this is a way to do it, and again, we're not going by Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is saying, if you have this giant field that's 30 times larger than the Bet Sa'ah, Okay, you have no way within even something 30 times larger to go ahead and plant more than one. And if you want to talk about two, you need a different separation. Halakha is not by that idea of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. And instead, the sages are saying that you can divide this up into, you know, it's 50 almost by 50 almost uh, square, and you can divide it up into 24 parts, and you can do nine. That's how you maximize it. Have a great day.